Welcome to Zambition, the channel on which we engage in dialogue with leaders from across sectors and generations. And welcome to Zambition. My name is Martin Kalungbanda, your host on this channel. I am extremely delighted and privileged to introduce our guest today. He's someone who needs no introduction, but I will nevertheless give you a few lines about him. His name is Dr. Nevas Sequila Mumba, a very well-known Christian leader in Zambia. He's a diplomat. He became vice president of our country. He is the MMD president. Dr. Mumba, welcome to Zambition. Thank you so much, Martin. It's an honor to be with you today, and I look forward to this great interview. I begin by inviting you to share an image or object that best describes who you are and the journey you have walked so far. Well, well maybe the best way to say it is to begin from the fact that um, I obeyed my heart to do what I've done over the past number of years. I did not pursue a particular career. I pursued my heart, that which I felt the Lord was laying on my heart. And that brought me into church, transitioned me into politics, it transitioned me into diplomacy. So you can see that I have had several um, engagements in three different sectors of society. And when I look at my life, the one object that I think uh, I can compare myself with um, would be uh, maybe a greater, you know, um, a greater earth moving equipment. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, when I look back at my 44 years of public life and ministry, I noticed that without me planning ahead of time, Almost everything that I did was pioneer work. It's like you grade a road where there was no road before. And therefore, all the challenges and the obstacles and the pain of um, being you know, the pioneer is placed upon you. The misunderstandings, the insults, and, and uh, the betrayals, and everything comes along with trying to establish something that maybe was not there before. And what I'm talking about is, for instance, when uh, I got um, the call to be involved in church work, when I felt the Lord had called me into church work, um, not that the gospel was not there, the gospel has always been there and always preached. But I think through our ministry of Victory Ministries, which I started um, uh, many, many years ago in 1980, um, I think the Lord gave us a totally different approach on how to maximize the uh, the spread of the gospel uh, mm -hmm. by what they call charismatic means and going out where the people are and, you know, really going full throttle of demonstrating the power of God. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that was very a, a very novel um, uh, period for the church uh, in the 80s when we started that. We had crusades, we eventually got on television, things that were not done before. So we were criticized a lot for that. But it's the same thing, uh, Martin, uh, that happened when I got into the political process. Mm. Um, it had not been heard at that time that a full throttle evangel evangelist and church minister could actually aspire for the office of president in this country. And therefore, it was a pioneer job. Uh, and it attracted even heavier criticism, heavier misunderstanding, heavier pain and betrayals. When I went into diplomacy, it was the same experience. 
it's like you know diplomacy is for for liars those who don't tell the truth instead of telling you what it is they lie and, and stuff like that so as a christian this is not something so there are certain things that we broke in order for the following generation to walk on this road without feeling what i felt without paying the same price that i paid in order to pave the way forward so a greater would you know would would be the right object although it doesn't look pretty thank you very much greater i wouldn't have guessed the image you are going to share but you say it paves the way it pioneers new paths and at certain times it might not even be allowed to drive back on what it had paved an extremely interesting image what you have can... been the two to three most formative experiences in your life dr mumba well i think i can actually pick one from each one of the three areas um but maybe let me just uh, concentrate on two Mm -hmm. um, from the church point of view, I, I think one of the defining moments of my ministry and life as a minister of the gospel was when I was having a crusade in Indola, uh, in Mushili grounds, mm -hmm. uh, one of my very first crusades. And um, there was a lady that uh, actually had died and was brought uh, from hospital because the parents just could not believe that their daughter could die and they were so desperate and they heard that there was a nervous mumba who prays for the sick and maybe he could do something there they brought her her name is christine kaonga she's still alive today and they brought her to the crusade and i was really intimidated when i saw what they did of course the previous night as every preacher would say i made a very loud invitation that bring anybody the sick the blind whatever um, including the dead, you know, would deal with it. I mean, I was just speaking as a young evangelist, but somebody heard me and believed me. And Christine was brought to the crusade, and um, I was so intimidated that the whole time I was preaching, I was not looking at that uh, mess that was in front of me, but eventually I felt the power of God telling me to concentrate on her because I'm about to do a miracle. And when I prayed, God raised Christine Kaonga from the dead. And this is a real documented story. It was on ZNBC and um, because at that time we were on television. So that really shifted my confidence in the God I served and gave mm -hmm. me a feeling of possibility that yeah. there's nothing impossible with God. In other words, I could step into any arena or do anything as long as God is with me. It is a possibility. So my kind of uh, attitude in terms of life and the way I look at it was greatly shaped by that miracle. I was very young. Of course, I had seen many, many other miracles before that and after that. But that one was defining because, I mean, it deals with something that I never thought would happen under my hand as a minister of the gospel. So that definitely changed my confidence levels, mm -hmm. both in God and in what I could do. Secondly, the other defining moment happened when I was preaching in uh, Amsterdam, in, 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 uh, in, in Holland. And uh, after a night of great, great uh, miracles and stuff, I went to the hotel. As I got into the hotel, I turned on television, it was CNN. And what I saw on the screen shook me. I saw that, you know, black, you know, Africans were running, you know, women and children and uh, men with, um, you know, mats and and things in their hands in their hundreds of thousands and uh, during that time as i was watching i noticed that the camera zoomed in on a little boy about six to seven years old mm. and this boy was sitting on what i later on realized was the body of a mother who had just been killed and the boy was crying mama mama get up get up mama get up and then um, the reporter, I don't know if it was CNN or someone, said in the background that this little child is going to be dead before sunset as well. Mm -hmm. And then it dawned on me that this was what they called the Rwanda genocide that was now in the offing and in which, you know, we lost close to 900,000 people, close to a million from that genocide. That event really shook me because it was at that pivotal moment I felt God speak into my heart that as long as Africa does not place premium on political leadership, 
and try to put into political leadership people with integrity and the fear of God, these events that we are seeing across Africa will only multiply. It was that shift that made me start to think, Lord, if nobody goes there, I'm ready to go there and sacrifice whatever that I have achieved so far in losing my name and getting the criticism. But we need, if my presence in politics is going to inspire other men and women of faith, then I'll, I'm ready to do it. So that, to me, Martin, was a major defining moment in my life. And eventually, it brought me into the political process. Incredible two stories that shifted you among the many. Allow me, Dr. Mumba, to just follow up on the first one. Um, the, the death of uh, the little child that was brought to you during the crusade. Was the death verified by medical doctors before uh, they brought the child to uh, your prayers? Well, basically what they told me, is, by the way, it's not a little child. It was it, She was not young. She, I don't know, maybe she was about 16 to 17 or something like that. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the age, but she was not a baby. Uh, the information they gave me when they came is that the doctor told them that your daughter is dead okay. and they refused to believe it. And uh, that's why they came and they just said no to it. I think they wanted to exercise their faith. But yes, they were told that your daughter is dead. There's nothing that can be done for her, even if you went to the crusade. So yes, that information they gave me, I didn't see the certificate, but uh, they gave me, but every sign was there. We, it was a lifeless situation that came to the crusade. Thank you. I would like now to find out what your view on what is going on in the country now, what got us here as a nation? What are the deeper issues that we need to address going forward? Obviously, thank you so much. I, I, obviously, you understand that it's usually not one singular event uh, that brings a country, a home, or a life to a deplorable position or condition. But I am, for the purpose of this um, uh, interaction, going to limit my observation to one major thing, which I believe, if, re if resolved, could have a direct impact on all the other uh, variables or, uh, that create uh, such a scenario as we do have now. First of all, we have to agree that the kind of life we are living today in Zambia and in most of Africa is totally undesirable. There could be those that believe this is okay, uh, but there are many like myself who believe that this is hugely a uh, substandard. Uh, mm -hmm. We deserve better, we can do better, and we can go further than this. Um, and obviously, there are people who feel the opposite. But I'm not addressing those who feel the opposite. I'm talking to those that really believe that uh, Zambia can be better and Africa can be better than it is. I think, Martin, our biggest challenge today in Zambia and in most of Africa is the fact that we have not placed premium on leadership. I am a believer that leadership determines everything. Uh, you can give someone one talent, like the Bible says, and another one one talent, and give them maybe five months to come and check on them. In the same environment, same conditions, one is going to multiply that talent into two talents. The other one will still have one talent. Or this mm -hmm. one will have 10 talents, and that one will still have one talent. It's a biblical truth in the scriptures that the one remained with the one talent because he claimed that the boss was a vicious man who sold where he, who ripped where he didn't sow. And the other one said that I multiplied it uh, and all that. So leadership is what we have mishandled on the African continent. And I think that we, ha we are very lazy in ensuring that people that we entrust with power to govern um, are worth the job that we give to them. And therefore, until we can courageously face this negativity, Africa and Zambia in particular, we will not rise to the levels that our other nations, for instance, have risen to in Europe and in Asia, where we, they had similar conditions in the beginning, but because of focused, determined, and leadership of morality and, and integrity to some extent, they brought their nations to where they are now. So the second question you've asked in the same question 
is that what are these deeper issues? Mm -hmm. I think leadership is number one. Two, the deeper issue, in my view, is um, the, elect the um, electing process. How we choose our leaders must be greatly and heavily interrogated in Zambia and Africa. Because the way we choose leaders now, it gives a greater edge to those who are maybe more crooked, more corrupt, with stolen money, and those who do not really have the concerns of the citizens at heart, but they do have means to fight themselves into office. So mm -hmm. when you look at certain countries that have really made it, they have had to deal with certain things. Maybe I'll not say much about other countries, but I can go to countries like um, Singapore and maybe let me dwell more on China. China may not be considered as a democracy as we know it from the West. But they have a system of which they call you know, selection then election. Mm -hmm. The reason I like that is because even the Bible says that you shall know them by their fruit. So you first have to understand who they are, what their background is, what they have achieved in terms of public service, being able to feel for others and empathy for those that don't have and they would like to make sure they empower others. You've got to have a track record that you can bring to the table and say, listen, we have got these seven people. This is what they have done. He was governor of this city. He was the minister for Northern province. Then he developed this and this is how he governed the province or something to that effect that you can place on the table to make sure that that person can be entrusted with something higher. Then those seven people can now be subjected to an election. Contrary to what is happening today, any crook from the streets in the name of democracy can run for president. He could be on drugs. As long as he's popular because he's dishing out money, you can end up with any leader of any sort. It is that recklessness and laziness and carelessness that has made Africa continue to be going backwards instead of forwards. And I think that, to me, the selection of leaders election of leaders is the deeper issue. But the first issue is a lack of leadership of morality and integrity. If we can deal with these two issues, Martin, I think that then we can talk about all the other variables that make a society to succeed. But in the absence of proper leadership, you can give them gold in their hands, they will consume it on themselves, their families, and those who worship them. Wow. Unless we tackle the issue of leadership, all other variables will keep eluding us. Dr. Mumba, we will take a little break. And when we return, I will ask you what your ambition is. <laughs> Are you an entrepreneur looking for a place to work from? Do you want to develop your leadership skills? Do you have an idea or business you want to scale? Are you looking for a place to host training and learning events? If you answered yes to any of the questions, then Impact Up Lusaka is the place for you. It is a social innovation hub that is part of Impact Up Global Network that supports various entrepreneurs and social innovators. Our services, among others, include co-working space, event hosting, incubation and acceleration programs, capacity building in leadership and business. Our guest today is Dr. Nevers Sequila Mumba, church leader, diplomat, former vice president, and president of the movement for Mount Party Democracy. Dr. Mumba, what is your ambition? What is your highest aspiration for our country? I think my ambition would be to bring order to Zambia, to bring order to politics, to bring order to the economy, 
to bring order in our social setup as a people. And here I'm referring more to uh, ensuring that we have working systems in the country to, to which all of us subscribe. The rule of law that all of us are committed to so that if you go to a supermarket and there are many people that are buying from off the teal, you find 10 of them, you don't jump the line to go and become the first one, but you become the 11th one in order to have a system in which we manage ourselves as human beings. I think one of the biggest problems Africa faces today is disorder, confusion that creates an atmosphere for criminals and crooks to, to do better than those who live by the rules and those who try to pay their taxes and those who want to do the right thing. So Africa has set the record the other way around. The more crooked you are, they call it being streetwise, and the more connections you have, the more you're going to do and the better you're going to become and more the opportunities you're going to have. I would like us to change that where order becomes the issue of the day. In other words, you go to the police, you have a complaint, regardless of which political party you belong to, they hear you out, they take you to court, and adjudication is done justly and equitably, not looking at the political party you belong to or the tribe you belong to. And in order to get that, you have to work on the systems themselves to give Zambia a new name. Because the Bible says a good name is better than silver and gold. Mm. What Zambia is lacking today is a good name. The question is, when people out there in New York hear the name Zambia, what's the first thing that comes to their minds? When people out there in the UK or Zurich hear the name Zambia, what is that which comes? Because the name must invoke either positivity or, or forget it. Those guys are, you know, still swinging from tree to tree. Those guys, you know, you can never, you know, deal with them. They are dishonest. Their leaders are thieves. Uh, we can't give them any more money because they are going to spend it on their girlfriends. You know, you've got to make sure that your name carries credibility. Just like in the banking world, uh, Martin, you know, you go to a bank and you want to draw a loan. Uh, the first thing they're going to look at when they're looking at your papers, they're really looking for your name. What is your history in repayment, your integrity, your morality? Can we trust you with more money? And that's all I'm looking for, that we need to clean the name of Zambia so that we make our leaders accountable and so that our systems begin to interrogate those who disobey the requirements of society because we live together as different people. And you cannot live like in the animal kingdom where there are no laws. It's up to the strongest to, you know, to command the jungle. And finally, on this subject, I have interrogated my mind to try to ask the question, mm. why do Africans who really become enlightened and, and they get educated and, and they're way ahead, want to fly to the UK and work there and fly to the United States and work there, go to Germany. I, I come to discover that there, they are tired of the nonsense. They want order. They want systems where what they have done can be awarded, uh, where their hard work can be rewarded. Mm -hmm. Here you can have a degree and as many degrees as you want. You will be governed by somebody who has never even entered the school classroom because, you know, it's got nothing to do with merit or what you have done. It's a system without order. And so, I would like under ambition. I've taken more time on ambition because I think this is what burns in my heart. We need to have a country that can be respected on the global platform, that when they hear Zambia, they want to fly here today. They want to live here. They want to move here. They want to invest their money here. But that depends on a good name, and we can make that happen. That's a very interesting um depiction of the Zambia you want, the uh, future of the country you want to work towards, order. Number two, you said order resulting into a system that works, that serves. And then finally, you wrapped it up by saying a good name is worth everything. Exactly. 
My next question, Dr. Mumba, is around the question of power, our relationship with power. And it's one of those things that are sometimes used to explain why we are where we are as a country. I have had the fortune of serving a number of heads of state on the African continent through the work that I do. You have been there, not just as vice president, but as acting president. Hero worshipping our leaders is a key challenge. It gives the false impression that there is one clever, gifted person out there who is going to solve all Zambia's problems. How will you address this? How do you currently, as the leader of MMD, and you can also take us back to the time you served as the vice president of our country. How do you relate with your fellow leaders? Are you one among equals or literally we need to immediately begin to bow because somehow it's presumed you have a hotline with the source of knowledge? Well, I, history has taught me that if you want to solve a problem, do everything in your power to understand how that problem evolved. Mm -hmm. Because once you understand the source of the problem, then you are going to apply the right kind of uh, medicine to deal with it. Uh, you must understand that for 27 years, our country was under one party rule. And that gave immense powers to the Republican president at that time, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda. And it really could have been anybody else. Uh, but that office was so revered, and in his hand was the destiny of every Zambian across the nation. Uh, that if he said that to bring him to State House, I will give him 10 houses tomorrow, it, it was that way. So people's allegiance was not really based on anything else except to ensure that if I can respect this leader, my life will be better. I'll have benefits and I'll be preferred. And therefore, the more I, 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 I lie on the floor for him, the more benefits I'm going to get. So for 27 years, that was inculcated within the Zambian people. Mm. It, it became part of us. So it became a cultural belief. It no longer was wrong. It was not wrong anymore. In fact, if you didn't do it, you were considered wrong uh, and you needed to be punished by most possibly the law for not um, you know, uh, showing that kind of allegiance, as they called it, or loyalty as they called it at that time. So it's a traditional problem that was inculcated within us. And that actually is what um, made the movement for multi-party democracy so attractive. Yeah. Because in our manifesto, we decided that we're going to fix that problem. We, we're going to fix the problem of too much power in one person and distribute the powers of the president into the institutions around so that the power is not centralized in an individual because it doesn't matter, Martin, how good that individual is. It didn't even have to be Kenneth Kaunda. It could be anybody else. The end was going to be the same. I believe myself that, you know, a leader is basically just the first among equals. Mm -hmm. He cannot be the storage of all wisdom. Mm -hmm. And the moment we lose this concept, I think that we are stealing uh, from the possibility of achieving something greater than ourselves. And the only way you can do that is to help others recognize they are playing around. And finally, on this issue, and, and I hope you don't mind me going back to the Bible that much. That's my basis of all this. But you'll all notice right. that this problem is in the scriptures as well, that when an angel appeared uh, mm -hmm. to a human being, um, you know, the human being actually bows down and begins to worship the angel. It took the angel to lift up the person and say, listen, I am not God. I'm just a servant. Please get up. I'm not God. What point am I trying to make? I'm trying to say that us leaders must help our brothers or say brothers and sisters, or if you want to call them your followers, 
help them by recognizing that you are not a god neither do you know everything above them you have when they come and start to kneel before you lift them up like angels do and say my brothers i am not god i'm just one of you and um you know please worship god and not me and africa needs to move away from this thing if we don't move away from this thing no one will criticize us no one will correct us and the people who are going to pay the highest price are those that have been governed because they can be misled because nobody is talking to this president. How do I handle MMD? I think that MMD itself is created in such a way that you cannot be too powerful as a president. The way they did the constitution they created after the one party state literally took away power from the president and distributed it amongst the cabinet ministers distributed amongst the leaders that are with you and without them the president would not do certain things and i think that i have adopted that spirit to depend on my colleagues who are better than myself in the areas of expertise to lead us and i hope that this will stay with me until jesus takes me home and i want to move on to uh the next question and possibly the final question Imagine you won the presidential elections this August and somehow just before you are sworn in as our head of state, you get a chance to look at yourself as if you are looking at another person. What is the most valuable piece of advice you would give to that person who is just about to be sworn in as a state president? Hmm. Wow. Wow. Listen, I would look into that mirror and I would say you are a disposable asset in the hands of God. By that I mean I want to remind him that you are not indispensable. You are disposable. Therefore, there is a reason why you have been elected and that is to take care of the business of God's people and they become priority. The moment you depart from the reason you were placed in that office, it is the proper thing to do to dispose of you. There are many people better than you that are behind you that can do the exact same job even better. You should, the reason I would say this is because no president or new president should ever have the feeling that although he has been elected, he's the best in the nation for the job that is being done. He should always know that God has given him a window to play a certain part. Tomorrow he will be removed and disposed of and somebody else will come there. Therefore, the, the short stint you have, leave it, spend it, mending broken lives, helping your country develop, leave a legacy behind, and do it in the fear and honor of the God who created that opportunity for you to you know, su superintend over God's people. So I would say you are a disposable asset in the hands of God. Dr. Mumba, as usual, it is wonderful to dialogue with you, to listen to the wisdom that you have distilled from the many paths, connected paths that you have walked. Church leader, diplomat, vice president and acting president on occasion and now vying for the position of head of state. I wish you God's most kind blessings. Thank you thank very you much. So much. Thank you so much, Martin, and uh, thank you for having me today and God blessings upon you. Thank you. Having listened to the dialogue and followed my conversation with our guest, I now invite you to look at the drawing that emerged 
out of that dialogue. Take time to see the contours, the colors, the images that are reflected on the painting, on the drawing. And pay attention to what the drawing evokes in you. Kindly share your reflections on this channel so that we can continue the dialogue on the future of the country we all love, on the future of our nation.